Is the U.S. economy being run by a failed businessman? As Donald Trump wages a trade war with China, tax records reveal he may not be the success story he makes himself out to be. I'm Imran Garta, and today's newsmaker is the President of the United States. Donald Trump is the first candidate since the Watergate scandal to win the White House without releasing his taxes. And that, he says, is a victory. Trump even took to Twitter to taunt his Democratic rivals, betting that if they make Trump's taxes a campaign issue, he'll definitely be re-elected. Well, as we now know, the New York Times uncovered a decade's worth of Trump's tax records, which show he may have lost more than a billion dollars. Trump's defense is that he just hid that money from Uncle Sam and that all real estate developers do it. But Democrats say it puts the president between a rock and a hard place. Either he's a tax dodger or an incompetent businessman. And neither option is a good look while the White House drags the U.S. economy into a trade war with China. Natalie Pahernan has more. U.S. President Donald Trump has repeatedly described himself as a successful businessman. But some recently leaked tax records from the 80s and 90s cast doubt on that assertion. A New York Times report says his property empire continued to lose money every year, totaling $1.17 billion in losses for the decade. The president says the losses were for tax purposes, and he described the report as very old information and highly inaccurate. Trump has sold his business expertise as a valuable asset in the White House. He promoted those credentials to voters. We're going to take back trade. I will create jobs. I'm a world-class business guy. He says now he's president, the U.S. economy is running stronger than ever, and he's claiming credit for it. The health of the economy appears to be a key part of his bid for a second term in office. Unemployment numbers are the best they've ever been, by far. Uh, we have almost 160 million people working today in the United States. That's more than we've ever had working in our country before. We're doing well on trade. We're doing well with China. On the surface, the U.S. economy is doing well. GDP growth is at 3.2 percent. Unemployment dropped to 3.6 percent, the lowest rate since 1969. And the official poverty rate is 12.3 percent, continuing its decline of recent years. But there is growing uncertainty about whether these numbers will continue their trajectory and if the economy will be able to withstand the blows of an ongoing trade war with China. An escalating standoff between the world's two largest economies has been looming since Trump took office. He has repeatedly promised to get a better trade deal with China than his predecessors. China has been taking advantage of the United States for many, many years. I'm not just talking about during the Obama administration. Uh, you can go back long before that. And it's been taking out 400, 500, 600 billion dollars a year out of the United States. And we can't let that happen. Uh, we're in a very strong position. Our economy has been very powerful. Theirs has not been. So far, neither side has been able to strike a bargain they can both agree on. And last week, the U.S. raised tariffs on more goods, while a Chinese trade delegation was still in the U.S. The U.S. tariffs affect $200 billion worth of Chinese products, including clothing, food, and even bicycles. Trump told China not to retaliate, but Beijing has announcing tariffs on $60 billion worth of American exports, like frozen vegetables, liquefied natural gas, and toothpaste. We hope that the U.S. side does not misjudge the situation and not underestimate China's determination and will safeguard its interests. It's been proved by previous experience that China doesn't want to join in the trade war, but we're not afraid of it, and if people attack our own home, then we'll fight them back. If Trump secures a new deal, it's a selling point he can promote in the next campaign. He says there's no rush. But if it takes too long to ink the agreement, 
will it prove too costly for voters? Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Well, I'm joined now from Rochester, New York, by David K. Johnston. He's a Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative reporter who released part of Donald Trump's tax returns. He also wrote The Making of Donald Trump and the follow-up book, It's Even Worse Than You Think. In Washington, D.C., we have John Tamney. He's the director of the Center for Economic Freedom at libertarian advocacy group Freedom Works. And in Binghamton, New York, is financial advisor Nathan Lewis, who's written the book The Magic Formula, the timeless secret to economic health and prosperity. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. John Tamney, let me start with you. So tax records show a billion dollars in losses for Donald Trump between 1985 and 1994. With that in mind, do you still trust him with the economy? Well, I think we probably overstate the billion. With, with real estate, there was, there was, an, there was an, an old joke back in the 80s that if they actually reduced taxes on real estate profits to zero, that the moguls would squeal. And so who knows what the actual losses are, but does it make me trust them uh, more or less? It would make no difference. I don't know an entrepreneur or businessman who hasn't had stupendous failures. If you look at Steve Jobs, does anyone remember Lisa? Does anyone remember Next? Um, his f failures were endless. Jeff Bezos freely admits to having had billions worth of failures. Now, let's be clear, I am not equating Donald Trump to Jeff Bezos, but I think to pin on him the failures, that describes any businessman. Okay, and it's interesting to point out, as you hinted at, that he avoided paying taxes for eight out of those 10 years because of those losses. David K. Johnston, is that a fair argument? Well, he certainly avoided taxes, and we know because of the tax returns I got that between 1995 and 2005, he had uh, income that he was able to wipe to zero of an average of $81.5 million a year. But Donald Trump, uh, all real estate operators can report negative income. Donald Trump went way beyond this. He overpaid for properties. He mismanaged properties. He's a terrible manager, as his own executives were telling me when I was covering him intensely in the late 80s and early 90s. Right. And he is a serious tax cheat. He has had two trials for income tax fraud, and he lost both of them. Right. Okay. Let me ask you about Trump's tweet. I'm sure you've read Trump's tweet, but for the sake of our viewers, he, on the one hand, he was defending his, uh, his business uh, practices in the, in the 80s and 90s. On the other hand, he was saying, this is fake news. David, he tweeted, does anybody really believe that a reporter who nobody ever heard of went to his mailbox and found my tax returns? At NBC News, fake news. David, was it fake news? Well, who gave it to you? The Trump White House confirmed the accuracy of this before he made that tweet, right. which just goes to how Donald doesn't pay any attention to facts. The White House itself said those that was, in fact, his 2005 Form 1040. Uh, and I believe, by the way, it was Donald who sent me that document, or had it sent to me by someone around him, oh. because he thought mm -hmm. it would make him look terrific. He didn't understand that I would show, because of my knowledge of tax law, that he was taxed in the regular tax system at a lower rate than the poorest half of Americans. They made $300 a week, he made $3 million a week. Okay. And the tax he did pay, 85% of it, he got back in subsequent years because of tax rules. I just want you to confirm that you believe that the president himself sent you his 2005 tax return. I, I believe he's the likely source of it, and more importantly, the White House confirmed that that is the right. tax return. Fascinating. Nathan Lewis, so we have the Treasury Secretary Mnuchin refusing to release Trump's tax returns, <laughs> even when Congress has asked. Does that mean that the president clearly has something to hide? Why is the, the Treasury Secretary doing this? Any businessman who, on the scale of operations of Donald Trump in the 80s and 90s, has incredibly complicated tax returns. Uh, he was also going through some bankruptcy issues at the time. He wrote about it in his books. It's no secret. And, uh, you know, most people don't know very much about taxes. They're very easy, just as this author is making today, to try to make various claims or insinuations, which is really just the process of doing business. Now, the entire property market across the board tanked in the 1990 recession. Uh, the people in the property business say it was part in part due to the changes in tax laws, which were very unfavorable for property after 1986. I don't think there's anything really of interest there. Okay, so David, are you just making unfair insinuations here? 
Well, we have lots of public record. I mean, I have tens of thousands of pages of Donald Trump documents that show he's a terrible businessman. His own executives were telling me every chance they got uh, at the time. And remember, Trump didn't go around saying, gee, I'm suffering like everybody else in a tough real estate market. He proclaimed himself the modern Midas. In fact, he told me one day he was worth $3 billion. Later in the day, he told someone else five. In his, the documents he had to produce later showed he had a negative net worth. Maybe he, he made $2 billion dollars at lunchtime. How do you know? It could have been, sure. <laughs> John Tamney, a crucial point here is that Trump has said that the voters don't care about tax records and tax returns. Is he right? Oh, I think there's some truth to that. For the voters, it's ultimately about the economy. You know, the, the reality, so tr Donald Trump is a terrible businessman. And let me be clear, my defense of him isn't a defense of all of his policies. I'm sure I could articulate much more clearly than, than Mr. Johnston what, where Trump is wrong on economic policy, and he's very wrong in a lot of areas. But the simple truth is all businessmen have stupendous failures and mistakes. Uh, is he a terrible businessman? Do you know of too many heirs who inherited whatever they inherited and created a global brand that such that their name is on buildings around the world, that they had a very highly rated TV show? Again, I could talk for days about where Trump's wrong. His comments on trade are flabbergasting for just how illiterate they are. But to pretend that he's just an awful businessman is not serious. And I think that gets into partisanship more than making, making a real statement because terrible businessmen don't have this kind of global brand. Okay, listen, I'm going to park off Trump's tax records for now because there's something very big that I feel privileged enough to have the opportunity to talk to all three of you uh, for. We weren't going to talk about this initially when we envisioned this segment, but... Then came the China news, and I'm really curious to hear what you guys have to say about it. So, Nathan Lewis, tariffs on China, these new tariffs, is that reckless or necessary? Um, in the short term, you know, tariffs are packed taxes, and they are going to impede trade. And there is a rather sordid history of, you know, tariff wars and so forth. Uh, I think Trump and his, the people he associates with, um, are trying to make a point about uh, whether sort of the principle of free trade is really good for the American people. Um, there are argues, arguments both ways, but I do think they have a point there. Right. It's not silly. Right. Okay, so John Tamney, Trump's saying that these massive payments, the tariffs, increasing uh, in, in the tariffs from 10% to 25%, that this goes directly into the Treasury. But other people analyzing this say, no, actually, the taxpayer is going to foot the bill. Who's right? Well, yeah, the U.S. taxpayer is going to foot the bill, and so if it goes to the U.S. Treasury, what's so great about that? It used to be that Republicans believed it was problematic for politicians to have more control over the economy's resources, so higher revenues are not a good thing. Are the tariffs reckless? Of course they are. Free trade is the greatest foreign policy mankind has ever conceived. Are they reckless economically? Potentially very much so. Let's remember, Apple is the second most valuable company in the world, the second most valuable U.S. company. It gets a fifth of its sales in China. Boeing sells a quarter of its planes in China. China's second is McDonald's second largest market. There are 3,500 Starbucks in China on the way to 7,000. It's Nike's second largest market. To put a bullet or to, tr to make China the enemy is to put a, is to basically harm the U.S. economy because we get so much growth in terms of what we take in from China, but also from what we sell to its increasingly inquisitive people. It's a huge mistake. This notion that there are victims of free trade is not a serious one. And so this is easily the, the worst aspect of Donald Trump's economic plan. This notion that trains, trade harms us and that it's warfare, he gets it exactly Exactly backwards. Right. So, David, why is the president doing this? First of all, I agree with the two previous speakers. Trade makes the world wealthier. There are people who are victims in trade, and other countries have policies to mitigate that damage uh, in specific industries. Uh, Donald has a degree in economics, but he did not earn it. And all you have to do is read his statements to understand he knows nothing about economics. He doesn't understand that the uh, tariffs he's imposing are higher prices on Americans and that also allow American companies that are inefficient to raise their prices to just below what the tariff will do to their foreign competitors mm -hmm. and therefore damages. If you're a developing country like we were in the 1800s and China is today, 
uh, having tariffs to protect your domestic market is a good thing. When you're a mature economy like us, no, they are damaging. There's no net benefit to them, and there's a huge threat to the world economy. And it's essentially because Trump doesn't understand economics. Well, somebody who seems to understand economics is Larry Kudlow, who's Trump economic advisor, the director of the National Economic Council. So this was a fascinating interview, Nathan Lewis, where he was telling Chris Wallace, I don't disagree with the fact that U.S. businesses and consumers will bear the cost. He said both sides will suffer on this, which was a remarkable admission. And he said this is a risk we should and can take without damaging our economy in any appreciable way. Is, I don't understand this fully, but I mean, I, I guess my simple question to you, Nathan, is Larry Kudlow going to get fired now? <laughs> I think, no, I don't think so. Um, I think if you, if you read the writings of Patrick Buchanan, for example, who is sort of a nationalist, if you want to put it that, economic nationalist, he proposed that uh, what you could do is, is have a 10 or 20 percent tariff on all imports across the board, just like a sales tax, and then eliminate all corporate taxes. And I don't know if that's the best idea. But it's one way you could you could run things and you'd have a pretty good economy because you'd have low corporate taxes. And, and if you accept the arguments that there are some prices related to uh, you know, cost of free trade that we're not willing to bear, especially for the lower 50 percent of society, it's an interesting uh, you know, proposal, I think, uh, which should be debated. And I think that's kind of where Trump is going with this. It's not really about China. It's sort of setting the stage for perhaps a little different approach internationally. John, you're shaking your head in disagreement. Well, I disagree, and I, I think Nathan knows why, and I think he ultimately disagrees with that argument. Uh, look at where people move in the United States. Do they move to the parts of the U.S. that are least engaged with the rest of the world? Are they moving to Aliquippa, PA? Are they moving to Flint? No, they're moving to the cities and states that are most engaged in global trade. They're moving to Silicon Valley. They're moving to Los Angeles, to New York. Uh, they are moving away from places that are basically trying to remain stuck in the past. Um, if Americans hated free trade, Walmart wouldn't be a very successful company. The reality is Americans love free trade because it gives them a raise every single day. We are the richest country on earth precisely because we are very nearly Hong Kong. The average tariff on foreign goods in the U.S. is 1.3 percent. And because we take in so much of the world's plenty, we get a raise, but it also makes us most likely, as Nathan's articulated so many times, over the years, it enables us to most specialize. If it were true that Americans were harmed by free trade, you'd see them moving to the parts of the country that are least engaged. The exact opposite's occurring. Right. David, let's game this out now. So let's try to get inside Trump's mind. He imposes these tariffs. He makes a big noise about them. He says, I'm finally resetting an imbalance here. He's probably going to expect the Chinese to retaliate in some way. What do you think he does after that? Well, Donald doesn't think long term. He is not a strategic thinker, and the Chinese are. I've gone to China many times, and they are clearly thinking like the Catholic Church, for example, in terms of centuries, not the next election cycle. So they, their response, they've already responded, is strategic, and it's aimed at certain specific pressure points for the United States. Uh, trade wars are just not a good thing to have. There is, of course, no such thing as, quote, unquote, free trade. That is a term of art. All trade has rules. And Trump, like previous presidents, uh, sees that there are flaws in those rules, uh, and we need to work on those. But in the long run, uh, I don't see where he's having any positive effect by his blunderbuss approach to this. Nathan Lewis? In, at least in the short run, um, immediately this stuff about tariffs and especially China and at individual, individual products and the idea of, of imbalances. Trade is always balanced, in my opinion. Um, it's very messy. Um, I don't like it very much. Uh, but overall, I think that Trump's handling of the economy is generally quite good. I think his uh, corporate tax reduction was absolutely necessary. Returned the U.S. to about the, the the average of the OECD at this time from being the highest taxes in the OECD. So generally, I think it's pretty good. We, sh we should take it all as one group, I think. Okay. And as we converge the two issues that we discussed, let's have them converge now and sort of wrap things up a little bit, right? I'm going to start with you, John. So we spoke about the president's 
tax records showing he lost a lot of money at a certain point in time. Some people hang a question mark over his credibility as somebody who can control the largest economy in the world. We've spoken about the potential for chaos given a trade war with China. But having said all of that, as things stand, the U.S. economy is doing pretty well. Is it doing well because of Trump? Or has he, has he just inherited something? Is he standing on the shoulders of a giant that is Barack Obama? Uh, well, I, I think it's fair to say that the economy was already improving. We saw that in the rising stock market. But I do think Trump's overall had a positive impact, probably not for the reasons he assumes. Uh, I think the reason he's succeeded, he's largely been a somewhat of a libertarian president. Were the tax cuts large enough? No, they were way too small. But in Trump's defense, he would have signed larger ones. Uh, our, our count at FreedomWorks is that for every new regulation, 22 have been repealed or allowed to lapse. That's a very big positive. Uh, the dollar, uh, he, he talked down the dollar a lot during his campaign, but he hasn't made a weaker dollar a major issue. I think that's been a huge thing for the economy with, with the dollar not in free fall. Investors feel more comfortable and investment is what drives economic growth. It's a shame that he's promoted this trade brinksmanship because it will do nothing to boost the economy. It just creates uncertainty. But I think overall, precisely because he can't get anything done, precisely because he has no strong relationship with Congress, uh, those are the presidents you want. You don't want a great businessman president. You don't want a president who does a lot of things. You basically want a distracted president. That's why Clinton w had such a good economy, and I think it's why Trump will have a good economy. He can't get much done. That's exactly what you want in someone in the White House. Okay, final comments from both Nathan and David. Nathan, you first. Should Trump be getting the credit and taking the credit for a decent U.S. economy right now? Uh, I think absolutely. Um, I think we would be much worse off if Hillary Clinton was president. I don't think Barack Obama deserves much credit except for that he didn't make many mistakes, didn't, didn't break very much. Uh, for the upcoming election, I don't think that you know, Trump's history, business history from 25 or 30 years ago is going to be particularly relevant. Um, I think he's basically basically on the right track now uh, some of this tariff stuff is a little worrying but um and if he stays on the right track and and maybe backs it up with some more tax reforms and regulatory reforms i think he's going to win two votes for trump so far well based on the economy david well he might get another term if he wins the electoral college but i went through the numbers all of my work is based on facts and trump has been touting 3.2 percent gdp growth in the first quarter that is the exact average of the last 72 years. It's just a C grade. By some measures, he has underperformed Barack Obama, as I reported at DC Report and showed the data. And he has absolutely underperformed on a whole variety of things. Uh, every president back to Jimmy Carter and Barack Obama in his second term. Okay, gentlemen, it's been good to chat. David K. Johnston, John Tamney, and Nathan Lewis, thanks so much for joining us on the Newsmakers. Syria's Bashar al-Assad is closer to victory than ever as his regime, backed by Russian forces, intensify their airstrikes on northern Syria. Their goal is to take back the rebels' last remaining stronghold. But at what cost? Well, it seems their methods include more than just illegal barrel bombs. The Syrian Network for Human Rights says during the past eight years, nearly 14,000 people have been killed in Syrian prisons under a systematic campaign of torture and abuse. In a moment, we'll talk to a panel of survivors. But first, here's Melinda Nusifora with this report. The scenes being played out on this Syrian stage aren't pure fiction. They're art imitating life. These actors say they're drawing on their personal experiences to breathe life into their characters. I spoke about my brother who was in jail. I spoke about my experience in prison and the torture I was subjected to. We brought together our own experiences with prison and we created these characters. It focuses on the emotions that the prisoners experience. What do they feel? How do they think? Who do they miss? How did the prison impact them? But when it comes to the prisons run by the regime of Bashar al-Assad, many questions remain unanswered. 
This grainy aerial photo is one of the few that exists of the notorious facility Sadnaya Military Prison near Damascus. Amnesty International has branded it the Slaughterhouse. In a 2017 report, the group estimated more than 13,000 people were executed in the prison without trial between 2011 and 2016. Across the regime's network of prisons, the death toll was almost 18,000. It's likely those numbers are higher now, more than two years later. Assad has dismissed Amnesty's report. The only evidence the outside world has are the shocking accounts of torture from those who survived on the inside. Melinda Nusofora, The Newsmakers. Well, let's go to our panel now. Joining us from Cologne, Germany, is former political prisoner Luna Watfa. With me here in the studio is Fadel Abdulhani, the chairman of the Syrian Network for Human Rights. Dr. Halal Ghawi is a surgeon who supports Syrian refugees through the organization Syria's Bright Future. And Veronica Bellintani is a researcher on Syrian issues whose husband was tortured in jail. I thank you all for joining us on The Newsmakers. Luna in Cologne, I want to begin with you. For those who don't know anything about what's going on in Syria and what's going on in the prisons, what are Assad's prisons like? Uh, in the prison, who know, uh, uh, a lot of people know nothing about the prisoners or the detainees in Syria. Uh, I witnessed many cases, uh, well, many bad cases actually, uh, for uh, women uh, with their children, with their children who, who were arrested, with a woman who gave birth uh, inside the jail, and uh, they had at, uh, at all uh, no, no health care at all. Uh, I witnessed also some uh, dead cases uh, who did under tortured uh, in the in the branches. Uh, many cases there have uh, nothing uh, to do, and we don't know anything about the detainees in the branches. Actually, we don't. We know only only about the detainees uh, in the central prisons. That's all. Veronica, does that sound familiar to you? Yeah, absolutely. My husband told me many stories about his time in prisons, from being tortured every day, being forced naked, to actually seeing many young guys in the same detention cell being uh, killed and dying in, under torture and being left with their bodies in the detention cell without having anyone taking the bodies outside the, the cell and leaving with the dead body for mm -hmm. a long time. Fadl, is, is this systematic and systemic or... Could it just be at a time of war, some people in the prisons abuse their authority? This is actually a tactic and, and widespread also. And it's described since the beginning of uh, level crimes against humanity. Mm. So this is actually not only one branch, si single branch in Damascus or in Homs. No, this is th types of machine. So all of the forced branch security, main security branches in Syria working together at the same types of, of, of torture. So it's uh, the same times in Homs, in, in, in Damascus, similar to Al-Hasaka, similar to Aleppo. So all of those machine working together at, at, uh, uh, simultaneously with the local militia as well. Mm -hmm. so, so the regime does not only use the, uh, the state institution security forces, the army as well, the army uh, uh, barriers, they are arresting people. No, also uh, sustain his, this, this method by also hidden or uh, secret center detention and also uh, doing the, the torture. And the outcome, the, the figures actually indicate and tells us that this is systematic way. Mm -hmm. So Syria is the worst country in or around the world which is using torture as a method of war. Yeah, Dr. Halal Khawi, is that how the women that you have worked with and the women that you have spoken to, is that how they have been treated? Have they been targeted specifically by the regime? Yes, uh, we know that uh, the Syrian regime not only targeted women, but uh, he, it's targeted women, as Fadl said, for social and the, the meaning of uh, the, the being a woman and exposed to sexual or any kind of violation. I will not say that all the women are, are being harassed sexually or raped or something like that, but it's a mean 
to uh, implement fear among the people mm -hmm. all over the world. Yeah, and Dr. Hala, how do they deal with the aftermath, with the scars, even if they make it to Turkey? Is there help for them? Um, psychological counseling, maybe? Yes. Unfortunately, the, the, these cases need long-term rehabilitations. And it's not actually being done, uh, and uh, we cannot uh, cover all those, uh, th those cases for different uh, reasons. So the, 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 the implication of being detainees or the, to, mm -hmm. to being survival of torture is too much uh, hard. And uh, you can say PTSD or post-traumatic stress, stress disorder. It's kind of multiple symptoms that prevent people to being uh, mm -hmm. to practice normal life. Right. Yes. And let's go to Luna in Cologne. Luna, you spoke about being in the prison and seeing other people suffer terrible things. Did they treat you all as if you were all yeah. treacherous, treasonous terrorists? Were you all... You, you said you, you were in prison for your freelance work as a journalist covering protests. Were you all treated exactly the same, or, or were they levels? Uh, actually, we have many levels of torture uh, inside the jail. Uh, I will speak about myself. I said that I was there because I documented the, the chemical massacre that happened in Eastern Ghouta. Uh, in the first branch that I, uh, I visited, uh, they, uh, they didn't uh, uh, torture me uh, physically, but they tortured me by taking my kids. They took my son, 14, uh, 13 years old, he was 13 years old, and they took my daughter, 11 years old. Uh, then they said that if I didn't give them the information that they wanted, uh, they will torture my kids in front of me. That kind of torture uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, as well. But uh, in the second branch, uh, they tortured me by beating all, all the time to give them uh, the information and to say that uh, the massacre uh, never happened and it was false and we made up all the evidence that what happened with me. I witnessed, as I said, the many cases of torture there also. Uh, in the second, in the third uh, branches that I uh, I visited, uh, they uh, they tried uh, to put me under the ground when I uh, made the uh, hunger strike because the bad conditions that I had there and the the old det detainees there also with me. Uh, they uh, said uh, to me, the director of the prison uh, told me that if I don't stop the hunger strike, he will put me under the ground and no one will ever hear about me. That's what happened with me, but what I witnessed is uh, it's something also uh, similar to that. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they used to torture any woman who, do, who doesn't cooperate. Uh, so, uh, like, uh, I, I think uh, there was a lot of women who were uh, 15 or 16 years old. Uh, 50 or 60 years old, sorry, but uh, they tortured them anyway. So there is no level with mm -hmm. torture. Maybe some women died there, killed there. They are all victims, but we didn't know about them. We couldn't hear a lot of, about the, the detainees inside the, the branch, as I said. Right. Mm, horrible stories. And a lot of the time when we talk about Syria and the war in Syria, we talk about barrel bombs, which are obviously terrible, and bombings and things like that. But uh, sometimes we fail to cover the kind of intimate violence of, of torture and rape. And I think this is a very important conversation to have. And as we move into the political side of things here, Veronica, a lot of Syrian refugees are being told, well, things are calming down now, so the country is OK to go back to. With all of this in mind, what goes on with what goes on in the prisons, is it a country that people should be going back to? Absolutely not. There are several reports of people going back to Syria and being detained, tortured, or disappeared. And all those conversations about um, returning to Syria, being able to return to Syria, is even another way that um, people that have been tortured are going to suffer more right now. Because what is important for former detainees, former and survivors of torture, is to be sure that now they are safe from any other um, chance to be tortured again. Be hearing those uh, discussion of people being deported or that Syrians should go back is only bringing them to have m many more nightmares during the night, having more flashback and mm -hmm. being even more in panic attacks about what could happen to them if in any case they would be deported or anything. So Syrians that are survivors or torture, rape should have a safe space even just like mentally in which they can be sure that they're not going to have a, any more a situation like this in their life. And those kind of conversations are only making right. survivors feeling worse and worse and worse right, right. now.
Right. Fadel, just last week, we had somebody on a panel with you who was saying, yes, there are terrible atrocities taking place. Yes, there's torture taking place in the, Sir in the Syrian prisons run by the regime. But everybody is doing it because it's war. So Hayat Tahrir Sham is doing it, and Nuruddin Zinke is doing it, and Daesh is doing it. Everybody is doing it. They kill children, they rape women, they're torturing detainees because it's war. What's your response to that, Fadil? First of all, regarding your question about the return, we need to ask about the fate of the disappeared women as well and the disappeared detainees. Those still fate, they're still uncovered and unrevealed. How we requested from the refugees or ITP to come back? Mm -hmm. This is a very important question. Still 1,000, 82,000 based on our database. Those are the, the, the minimum level. Forced disappeared people, that's a huge figure on a small society like Syria. And regarding your topics as well, that's also well-documented conflict in Syria. So we have uh, we, 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 uh, the figures speaking about themselves, the scale from the regime, the percentage. The regime is committed above than, in general, like 85% from the total crimes. And all the other party, all included ISIS, included, included the uh, opposition, including PYD as well, as a party, uh, all of them, like their, their uh, figures and the, how, how, how much person they killed due torture are 15%. So that also showing us that the scale is very important and the percentage as well. As I mentioned, the regime is using the state institution to achieve something actually. Mm -hmm. and, and all the Commission of Inquiry reports mentioned that the regime is targeted and used a w torture a uh, systematic way and widespread as well. And this is amount to be crimes against humanity. Not only the Commission of Inquiry, also the, gener the General Assembly as well. And they didn't mention that to, to the other party. And, and, and they're here, there is a good re recognition in international law. That's when it, it is not a widespread, it's, it's called war crimes. The regime is committed to crimes against humanity, which is higher than war crime, mm -hmm. and it's systematic and also committed a war crime, so right. both of them. The other party, is they mentioned it's, it's a war crime. It's, it's not a systematic way, uh, unlike the regime, actually. So that's a very important recognition. The figure is talking about themselves. The cases also, we are reflecting the, the, the fact on the ground. If the, if the PYD committed more crimes than the regime, we'll say this, in, at this types right. of crime, the PYD is overcome the regime, so, so, right. so that. Dr. Halal Ghawi, is everybody doing it? Is everyone torturing? Everyone torturing, yes. But how, how uh, as Fadl said, how the percentage, it's different. Right. How it's systematic, it's the difference. Also, if the regime, it's like to be who saving all the people in, under his, uh, its control, so the fault is for the regime. But... Uh, um, I can say also about, again, what uh, my colleagues say about the return back of the, the people who were traumatized and v being victim of torture is very big issue mm -hmm. and cannot be dealt easily. I'm just talking about this. Right. Because fear still, uh, uh, the, the most of the symptoms are suffering from are avoidance. So the people were taking from their place, uh, their working, uh, from their clinics, maybe for the doctors, from the way. So anything will remind them with this trauma and mm -hmm. uh, let them not thinking again about return back until uh, a transitional justice took place in Syria. Right. And we, as we talk about transitional justice, uh, Veronica, for a lot of victims of the regime, victims of torture, Vict uh, victims of terrible crimes, there's the very distinct possibility that there will be a peace deal in Syria, but it would also mean that Assad stays and there will be no accountability for the regime. Would they ever accept that? Uh, my own experience of my husband, absolutely not. I think that a person that has been tortured cannot accept to be able to go around their own city, whether it's Damascus or Aleppo, and seeing the same person that have tortured them to walk free. This is something that happened in Bosnia and is not absolutely accepted by victims of torture and rape. And I don't think that any Syrian that has dignity or has any uh, hope mm -hmm. to have a normal life can accept to see people that have been, that have been torturing hundreds of 
Syrians for years right. to be free. And obviously, uh, any kind of amnesty, any kind of transition without accountability cannot be accepted right. because it will mean that um, a person that has been tortured needs acknowledgement of his suffering, needs to recognize that what happened to him was wrong, that everything that was um, robbed from him during this month or years of torture can um, be achieved again, whether that's education or healthcare or anything. And the lack of accountability will completely uh, undermine this, and so would undermine the ability to go back to a normal life. Right. So, no. Luna, would you ever accept a peace deal where they say, we're going to have peace now and we'll deal with justice later on? Uh, actually, when I was in the jail, uh, the Caesar's photos was, uh, were leaked uh, to the whole world. And in that time, I, I had a hope that uh, something will happen. But after all, nothing happened. We are now after eight years from our revolution and nothing happened. No one uh, be held uh, accountable. So this is why I don't know how the justice will be in Syria if this regime will not be held accountable. This regime is not one man. It's the whole system. His assistant, his uh, security system also, all the branches there in Syria, all uh, those uh, people who are involved in our blood and in our tragedy. So the justice in Syria, it's not something that will happen right now or in the, in the future. I don't think so. Okay. On that very somber note, Luna Watfa, Fadl Abdul Ghani, Dr. Al Al Ghawi and Veronica Bellentani, I'd like to thank you all for joining us here on the Newsmakers. Thank you. Thank you. One size fits all approach of banning everything under CITES, disregarding the good efforts and investments by our respective governments, is neither sustainable nor desirable. We must reject it. Six African nations, including Zimbabwe, South Africa, and Botswana, are calling for the ivory trade to be made legal again. Leaders there say elephant poaching has actually surged since a ban came into effect in 1990. They also argue that despite the rise in illegal hunting, elephant populations have still risen and are causing problems for residential areas. Finally, those presidents point out that the decision to regulate ivory should be theirs to make and not international bodies or foreign governments. Well, let's go to London and speak with Barnaby Phillips. He's with the Elephant Protection Initiative, working for a sustainable future for Africa's elephants. Barnaby is also an ex-colleague of mine, so lovely to see your face again, Barnaby. Good to have you on the Newsmakers. So this is a fascinating story, right? Because we have the international organizations on the one hand saying elephant conservation and the leaders of these southern African countries saying elephant management. Are we going to find ourselves at a sticking point? It's been stuck, Imran, this debate for, for decades, in truth. It's a, it's a little bit more complicated than just, say, Western uh, conservation groups versus Southern Africa. The divisions are very deep within Africa itself. The, the five Southern African countries that want to resume ivory trading, in one sense, they are in a strong position because the majority of Africa's surviving elephants live in those countries. On the other hand, they are very clearly within a minority of African elephant range states, of which there are still, uh, mm -hmm. even today, some 35, some 36. And the vast majority of countries in uh, Eastern Africa, Central Africa and West Africa uh, want the ivory trade moratorium to be maintained for the ban to stay in place. And that's why the Southern African countries have consistently failed at meetings of the African Union uh, to get the rest of the continent to go with them. And that, in part, is the cause of their frustration. Right. And in the setup to you, we heard from Emerson Nangagwa. In addition to him, Botswana's president saying, we cannot continue to be spectators while others debate and take decisions about our elephants. Namibia's president saying, I listened this morning to all, ex all experts lecturing us and I wanted to ask where they come from. If they are from Europe or the US, I wanted to ask them how they destroyed all their elephants but come to lecture us. So this is a very political issue and it's a very sensitive issue for a lot of them. They feel, these Southern African nations feel that the conservationists don't understand the context within which they have to live and operate. Are you partial to that argument? 
I have a lot of sympathy with that argument, yes. And I think it's a bit rich, frankly, for people who come from a country like Britain, where we wiped out our own large, dangerous mammals, uh, wolves and bears back in the Middle Ages, uh, to be too moralistic or, or sanctimonious about this. And I think people in the West have to understand that living alongside elephants, say in a country like Botswana, is not always easy. Elephants make difficult neighbors. They destroy crops, they destroy fences, they destroy water installations. Uh, sometimes they, they kill people. And I think people who are in that front line of that human elephant conflict, which is not unique uh, to Southern Africa, it's happening across Africa as not so much elephant populations growing, although they are growing locally in a, in a few places. The overall trend is downwards. But above all, of course, human populations mm -hmm. are, are growing very dramatically in, in Africa. Uh, and so, yes, I, I have some sympathy for that. But uh, on the other hand, uh, these Southern African countries have to look at the larger political context. Who exactly do they intend to sell their ivory to? The overall demand for ivory, legal and illegal, over the past two decades or so, has come from China. Well, China implemented a comprehensive ban on ivory back at the beginning of 2018. So it's not quite clear uh, where those stocks of, say, Botswana or Zimbabwe or Zambian ivory are going to go. Are they going to try and prevail on other countries to withdraw from CITES? That's the international mm -hmm. convention which monitors international trade. Well, you know, that, that, that comes with all sorts of international reputation issues, all sorts of consequences. Uh, and I was in Kasani at that summit in northern Botswana, Imran, and for, and for all the heat and the anger, which undoubtedly is genuine, uh, I sensed that Southern African countries were, gonna, were not ready to take as drastic a step as that. What is the compromise, if there is to be one? Do you crack down on illegal poaching but find other ways to legalize it in some way? Tell me, tell me how, how this comes unstuck. One of the issues is hunting and allowing safari hunting of elephants, which is not the same and shouldn't be confused as the ivory trade. So in particular, that has been the model of, of conservation in South Africa, in Namibia, in Zambia, in Zimbabwe, uh, also incidentally in countries like Tanzania, which is anti the ivory trade. And Botswana is very much on, on the fence here, and, and that's you know, wh where a lot of the interest is. I mean, just a bit of context for viewers, Botswana has perhaps 150,000 elephants, maybe more. There are only perhaps just over 400,000 elephants left in sub-Saharan Africa. So you can see just politically, in elephant terms, Botswana is a giant. Botswana rather abruptly ended safari hunting in 2013, 2014, under the previous president, Ian Kama. And President Masisi, the current president, is under enormous pressure uh, to bring it back. And I got the clear impression in Botswana last week that that is the direction in which Botswana will be going. And so what happens there is that a person, say, from America, Germany, Italy, the Middle East, wherever, goes to a country uh, like Botswana uh, and spends, in some cases, tens of thousands of dollars for the right to shoot an elephant. Now, you and I may find that distasteful, may not find that anyone's idea of fun, but if somebody is prepared to spend that money and if elephants are well protected and in sustainable, uh, it's done in a sustainable, legal, corrupt, free way, and crucially, if the benefits accrue to those communities who we were talking about at the beginning, the people who live right. around elephants, well, then you can see that there is a conservation model there uh, that could work and that could be uh, a win-win model. But it's, it's a very emotive issue, as you'd imagine. Right. Is there a conversation happening between the decision makers at CITES, people from organizations such as your own and these southern African nations. Are you guys talking to each other? Yes, we're, we're, we're in dialogue all the time. And Botswana is an Elephant Protection Initiative uh, member. That's the organization I work for. So too is Angola, by the way, who were at that meeting uh, in, in Kasani. And it's very interesting when you see a country like Angola interacting with Botswana, its neighbor, and they're just in completely different places. I mean, they, they understood each other and it was very diplomatic, uh, but it highlighted the very different status, if you like, of the elephant, of conservation and of politics in African countries. There are very few elephants left in Angola because of the decades of civil war. Botswana would love 
Angola to become again a peaceful tourist country and for lots of its elephants to migrate back into southeastern Angola. It sounds a bit fanciful, but in theory, it could uh, alleviate some of the pressure in northern Botswana. But w when you see just how differently the perspectives are of a country like Angola to its southern African neighbors, when you see how differently a country like uh, Kenya, which is firmly anti-hunting, firmly anti uh, the ivory trade and which has based its economic conservation model on photographic tourism, uh, it, it, these intra-African uh, difficulties run deep. Of course, uh, tragically, the, the big CITES conference that was due to take place in Sri Lanka later mm -hmm. this month uh, was cancelled following the attacks there some three weeks ago. Uh, some three weeks ago. So things haven't quite come to a head. Right. Uh, we expect that meeting may take place uh, towards the end of this year, 2019. Okay, we'll be watching closely. And when that happens, and if there are any developments, we'll come calling again. Barnaby, great to talk to you. Barnaby Phillips joining us there. And that's all for this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garta. Check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Remember to like, follow, and subscribe. Next time, Afghanistan, where aid workers and journalists are under attack. Is the Taliban more emboldened than ever? And is this a sign peace efforts are failing? Until then, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.